Hey everyone, welcome back. In this video, I just want to talk about my workflow, the tech stack I use, and some intuition to help you get started creating your own multiplayer application, like the one that you see here. I can type, it's still a work in progress, but I feel like I have enough in order to help you get started on your own. And I, you know, I'm just gonna be building on it for a little bit while after this, but you know, I have enough to help you get started with it if you want to. All right, so that's pretty much it for the introduction. You can go ahead and skip the, to the timestamp while I start, but I kind of want to also explain why I'm working on this. So I don't know if you know, but in the news, you know, at least in the US, I don't know globally, but loneliness has become an epidemic and university students struggle with a lot of things. They struggle with mental health, stress, and I hope, you know, a social VR application can hopefully, you know, help alleviate some of those issues, you know, especially people with social anxiety, you know, meeting people in person is kind of hard. So the idea is kind of you talk to them online first uh, before meeting them in person. You know, obviously it's only going to be registered Penn State students on here. It's not going to be, you know, complete strangers and stuff like that. You know, there's also a lot of other uses, uh, for example, nostalgic, nostalgic purposes. You know, like in a five years, you want to see revisit the campus, but you can't really. And Google Maps, they don't show you inside of buildings, right? They only show you outside. So when you can go inside buildings, you can kind of like, hey, remember, you know, when we met here and, and, and things like that. The, you know, other things we have like campus tours, you know, again, Google Maps only shows you the outside. You can't really tour inside. You know, you can explore areas. You can do things in VR that you can't do in real life. Otherwise, it would be kind of inappropriate also do like dangerous simulations for example simulations that you can do online but you can't do it in person because it's too expensive too dangerous to do so those are you know that's like a more educational resource other things i was planning to hopefully eventually connect to like restaurant apis so you can you know order online through the vr application you know of course there's a bunch of other things for example if you have you need to identify bathrooms because you know, for health reasons like overactive bladder and things like that, you know, a VR application can help you do that because you can identify the bathrooms without having to scout out the area um, once you get there. You know, it's going to help you plan. It's going to help you do things and, and a lot of other stuff. Yeah, that's kind of a lot of other reasons, but I don't want to take this video isn't about that. But that's kind of why this is like one of my bigger projects that I started working on. That's that. And all right, let's get into the video. In this section, I kind of just want to explain the basic intuition when working with a front end and back end. So when I visit a website, I'm presented with the front end code, and I'm sure we're all familiar with this. You know, in this case, my player is going to be a hamburger because I thought it was funny. Um, you know, obviously you can put, you know, parameters, you can get them from like user inputs or something. And then I create a new hamburger and then I add it to my 3GS scene. Yeah, that's pretty much it. And then, you know, whatever you want to do in the front end with the hamburger, for example, make it move with the WASD keys or the arrow keys, you can do that uh, right here. So that's what happens when I visit a, um, you know, a website. And then the front end's like, hey, you know, I, I added this player to my scene, and I'm going to tell that to the back end. And the back end's like, oh, cool. And then to other people show up, they also visit their website, you know, they input their own hamburger parameters, and they also add that to their own scene. And, you know, so once they're connected, they also send that to the back end, and they uh, send that to the back end as well. And then the back end, you know, tells uh, these front ends now that, you know, you need to add these other players. So, you know, for example, this guy right here, I'm just going to draw, it's just going to be like, oh, hey, you know, front end, you need to add another hamburger with the set of parameters that I sent to the back end. And the same thing here. So I'm going to go back and I'm just going to copy this. Oops, sorry. Wrong, wrong application. Wrong hockey, wrong applications. Too many hockeys to remember. And now I'm just going to be copying that, um, this to this front end and this front end. And now this front end is like, oh, thanks back end. I didn't know there was another player. And then I'm now going to add that new hamburger from the back end, the data that I got from the back end to, to, to my scene. And then obviously the same thing is going to happen for these as well. You know, this one is going to go here and it's going to send to the other two players. And obviously, you know, in order to manage this, you need some sort of ID. So that's how you're going to track the differences 
you know, between the players. And obviously when someone disconnects, for example, if I delete this and this one, you know, it's not going to send, it's not going to send anything to the back end. So the back end isn't going to be sending anything to the front end or the connected players, basically. Yeah, and that's kind of just the general intuition on, on making a multiplayer application. So now I kind of just want to show you what that looks like in code. The code is a little messy. I haven't, um, I haven't updated it to make it look nice yet. Um, but basically on the right here, I have my front end code and on the back here, I have my back end. So, you know, when I visit a website, I'm going to be sending a connection from my front end to my back end. And then my back end's like, oh, hey, another connection. Let me make some user data for that connection. And then it's going to get a bunch of data that I input from my front end. For example, here I can say I'm saying to my back end what kind of avatar that I'm um, sending to, to my back end. And then it's going to update the user data in the back end. And then it's going to, you know, it's going to add that to an array of players, basically. So, you know, another, let's say another person visit, visits the website where they're going to have to send another request. Backends are going to be like, oh, hey, um, you know, another player. I'm going to create another player for that user. You know, obviously, when you are connecting, there's also an ID associated with each player you mentioned. So that's how we know that this one's going to be different. And... Then, you know, same thing happens, you know, whatever the user enters from the front end, it's going to be sent to the back end to be used as data. And then this is going to, you know, now have a length of two people in there. And, you know, every so often, I'm going to be sending this player data to the front end and the front end is going to be adding the players to their scene. So here you can see in player.js, you know, if, if the player exists in my scene, I'm going to update it. And if they don't, then I'm going to create a new avatar for them based on the data that I get from the back end. And I'm going to add that to my scene as well. Um, the code is a little bit messy, but I feel like you can get the general idea. And yeah, that's kind of the general intuition on, on you know, how it looks in code. You have multiple front ends all sending data to the back end. Back end is sending all that data that all the front ends are giving it to all the front ends so the front ends can update, you know, whatever they're going to be doing. So in this section, I want to talk about my tech stack and I'll be going through each of these and my general workflow for this project. Now, I use a lot of other things, just not for this specific project. These are going to be only the stuff that I used for this specific project. Um, you know, I don't want to give you, you know, I don't want to give you an overabundance of resources and you having to navigate through all of them, you know, if it's, you know, if it isn't really necessary. So this is everything I used for modeling. So Figma, I use it to create image textures. So here I have a bunch of images of my university. I have hundreds. I first uploaded them to Figma just for myself, but I also have a bunch on PureRef. Um, if you've never heard of that before, it's a pretty popular thing to hold reference images. Obviously, you can also bring your reference images directly into Blender, but since I have so many, I don't, I don't really do that. So yeah, here you can see I have an image texture here that uh, I created in Figma. These are from these are just logos that I googled and I downloaded them and copy and pasted them into Figma, and then I just have the the design here that I created, and then obviously I, then I just. Figma allows you to export it. You can export it as such as these. And that's what I did. So I exported it as an image. You can see I'm now using that as an image texture into my blender. And if I select this, you can see it's UV wrapped, UV mapped onto the texture that I created. You know, it'd be nice if this exact thing was, you could find it directly on Google. Then you could just download that image and use that instead of, you know, having to custom make it like I did here. You can see if I ungroup it, I have, this didn't even have a transparent background. So I had to select the color, you know, using Figma. Luckily they have this eyedropper tool. So that's all I did. And you know, no one, no one knows that it's not a transparent background. That's what I use Figma for. Oh yeah. I also used Figma for, to design the intro screens. I'm sure everyone knows what Figma is and I already mentioned peer wrap. Yeah. So university of resources at my university, the office of physical plant. They have these public reference images of my building for the floor plans. Add that as a reference image to Blender. And you can see that here. It's a reference image here. And then I just, you know, modeled along the reference, basically. Obviously, I used Blender for 3D modeling, as you already know. And some really helpful Blender plugins that I used is UV Packmaster to, you know, pack UVs. Simple Bake 
makes baking in Blender so much easier. If you've ever tried baking in Blender, it's it's a complete nightmare, especially for a large scene where you're going to need to bake multiple materials and multiple objects. You know, please do just buy Simple Bake. You can watch a quick tutorial on that. Blender Kit is the same way. It makes your life so much easier. Instead of having to download textures, PBR materials from the internet, all you have to do is search it right here. You know, obviously you're not always going to find what you want, but often you do. So it's kind of enough. And I feel like it just saves you so much time. For example, let's say I want like carpet or something. You know, I can just find a carpet that I like. And the best part is that I can just click and drag and it'll, it'll replace it'll replace it right then and there. Yeah, but a lot of add-ons do do the same thing, you know, go around and explore to, to find something that suits you. And this one is free. It has the free version and obviously there's a paid version, but I'm on the free version. So yeah, definitely, definitely get this. It saves you a lot of time. Yeah, so sometimes I edit, you know, Figma doesn't have very many extra editing tools. So sometimes I use Photoshop to edit them a little bit before I attach them as images. You know, sometimes I do use PowerPoint. Obviously, I know, you know, there's there's a lot of other tools that are better for editing images than PowerPoint, but for some reason, I just find PowerPoint sometimes easier. And the lighting setup I used, I just followed this tutorial and it worked out really well. So you can just watch that. Other textures, you know, when Blender Kit didn't have them, I looked at here and here. And for some of the models, you can look at Blender Market and ArtStation. They have some good models for sales. And then backend, yeah, Express.js, easy server setup. This isn't necessary. Socket.io is not necessary. Obviously, these just make things easier. You can just work with you know, the native web APIs if you want to. And for the front end, Vite, I don't really need a bundle that's designed to handle like bigger projects at the moment. And then, yeah, for this project, I use SCSS instead because I was going to have a lot of CSS files. And I feel like the benefit of using SCSS is just just outweighs CSS. And Vite supports SCSS out of the box. So I didn't have to config it or anything. Some other packages I use are concurrently. And this just allows you to multiple commands really easily. And if one of them breaks, you can just it'll stop the other one. So here, if npm run front end build uh, breaks, then it's not going to run the back end either. And it also just kills all the processes before. So basically, I build out my front end, which is the dist folder right here. And then that's when I run my back end right after that. And that's just so much easier than running back and forth and, and, and stuff like that. So that's that. Include media. You can just Google this. Nipple JS, it's yeah, you can Google that as well. And then GSAP, everyone knows GSAP. So here's some miscellaneous tools that I use. So Transfonter, you can convert downloaded fonts into WAF and WAF2 files and also provides ready to use CSS imports for you. So instead of having to manually create your own font family and your CSS files for the fonts that you downloaded, it will generate that for you. And it'll also convert your fonts to WAF and WAF2 which is good for the browser. And this is really nice. This is really helpful to optimize images. And all you have to do is drop an image in here. So I'm just going to, you can see this here is 12 uh, megabytes. I'm just gonna drop that in there. And you can see I dropped it down to 375 kilobytes. And you can choose your the format that you want. If you want transparency, you can change to WebP. The best part is you can actually see the difference on the slider. So on the right is gonna be your compressed image. And on the left is going to be your original image. So you can see how the different that is. Look how sharp the shadow is in my original image. And then over here, it's, you know, it's extremely pixelated. This one I haven't used yet. Well, actually I have, but I haven't put it in my code yet. But I'm planning to switch my textures to basis. And if you don't know what that is, you know, it's not a big deal. But the other thing I used is HDRI to cube map. And this just allows me to download an HDRI and put it into a cube map into 3GS for the scene background that you see that you can view in the introduction. There's like a small little background there, you know, that looks like this of mountains. Then I used Mixamo for character animations. There's hundreds of tutorials on this for, for Blender and, and 3GS actually, so nothing too special there. And Ready Player Me for free characters, which is pretty popular in the 3GS community or in, in the VR community. Uh, in general, I don't know if anyone has ever heard of Spatial.io. This is pretty popular and they also integrated 
with Ready Player Me. Uh, definitely check this out if you want free characters rather, rather than having to model them yourselves. Kind of just one final tip. If you think of a tool, you know, just look it up. It probably exists, right? Like if you want a noise texture generator, just type in noise texture generator into Google and then maybe even CSS after, you know, however you want to query it. And, and it probably exists. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Everything I used for this project specifically, you know, for future projects, I'll be talking about different technologies and reasons why I use those as well. But yeah, that's pretty much it. You know, it doesn't have to be daunting to create, create something like this. And I hope that helps you get started. See you in my next video. Bye.